Dr. David Weinfeld joined Rowan this year, right, last semester. Um, he was at the University of Virginia Tech? Virginia Commonwealth University. Virginia Commonwealth. I knew this. Um, he was previously at Virginia Commonwealth University. It's in the book, right? It is in the book. Um, he has produced a lot of really interesting scholarship, um, including this book. Can everybody see it? Am I Up. Brand new book. Wonderful. Very cool. Cornell University Press. Um, this is a really exciting book. Um, An American Friendship between Horace Callan. Horace Callan, Elaine Locke, and the Development of Cultural Pluralism. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it. It's really exciting work. Today, right, we are getting Southern Jews and the Lost Cause between Southern memory and Jewish identity. And I'd like to ask everyone to help me welcome Professor David Weinfeld. Thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, coming out this evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed, for uh, organizing this event. Um, I, uh, you know, yesterday was the, the Jewish holiday of Purim, uh, which is kind of like Jewish Halloween. Uh, I dressed up as a bagel with locks and cream cheese. Some of you already saw that image. It's not going to be in the slides, but I can show you later. But uh, I did want to say that the fact that yesterday was Purim is sort of fitting for the talk. Uh, that I'm about to give uh, this evening. Uh, the story of Purim, recorded in the uh, biblical book of Esther, tells of the Jewish community of Shushan, or Susa, capital of the ancient Persian Empire. The Purim story is about Jewish life in the diaspora, likely a fictional tale, but one with a lot of broad truths. It's about assimilation and bigotry, about being a minority, struggling to survive and maintain its distinctiveness. And really, Jews have been navigating these questions for over two millennia. And today, I'm going to look at a specific case, that of Jews in the American South from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and their engagement with a phenomenon known as the Lost Cause. Now, it's well known that prior to the Civil War, some Jews in the United States owned enslaved people, and that many Southern Jewish men fought for the Confederacy. But less well known is the story of Jewish commemoration of the Lost Cause. So what is the Lost Cause? The Lost Cause was the notion that the Confederacy was a just and honorable experiment, that slavery was benign and even beneficial to enslaved African Americans, and at the same time, not the real cause of the Civil War, which was in fact about states' rights. According to Lost Cause adherents, the noble Southern slaveocracy had been uh, defended by a valiant Confederate military with saintly and heroic generals, Robert E. Lee, the saintliest of them all. Here you see the monument to Robert E. Lee in Richmond. The Lost Cause was propagated in different ways, through textbooks in schools, through memorial ceremonies, and by building massive monuments to Confederate so-called heroes. Perhaps the clearest expression of the Lost Cause by a Southern Jew, however, did not occur in the American South, or even in the American North, but in Rome, Italy. Moses Ezekiel, a proud Sephardic Jew, native of Richmond, Virginia, and veteran of the Confederate Army, had moved to Europe after the Civil War and become a celebrated sculptor. In 1876, in honor of the centennial anniversary of America's founding uh, and uh, commissioned by the or United Order of B'nai B'rith, Ezekiel had completed his sculpture, Religious Liberty. Uh, today, it stands on Independence Mall in Philadelphia in front of the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History. It was this work that, is, that made Ezekiel perhaps the most celebrated Jewish artist of his day and solidified his legacy as a Jewish artist. But 15 years later, Ezekiel expressed disappointment at having his bid to craft a sculpture of his hero and friend, Confederate General Robert E. Lee, ultimately 
rejected. In a letter to uh, the Monument Association of Richmond, Ezekiel opined, to honor the dead soldiers, the true heroes of a lost but just and sacred cause, must be to call forth the applause and sympathy of all men who feel a brotherhood in the South. Ezekiel had wanted to honor, uh, wanted the honor of being the man to celebrate General Lee, who he called the leader of the army of the South, who fearless of danger, defying death and misrepresentation, has the brightest star in our glorious constellation. Not much clearer an expression of the lost cause than that. Though Moses Ezekiel never made that majestic Lee statue of his dreams, he created monuments to the Confederacy across the country, from Virginia mourning her dead at his alma mater, the Virginia Military Institute, to Southern at Johnson's Island, Ohio, in Lake Erie, a site of a Union prisoner of war camp, he made a statue of Thomas Stonewall Jackson uh, that stands in Charleston, West Virginia. And his most famous Civil War monument sits in Arlington National Cemetery in Northern Virginia. Unveiled on June 4, 1914, Ezekiel called it New South, and it depicted not just uh, heroic Confederate soldiers, but if you look at the close-up, also enslaved African Americans, who the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the key sponsors of this monument, labeled, and I quote, faithful black servants. This monument made Ezekiel the foremost sculptor of the lost cause. Ezekiel's legacy has grown controversial of late. A little over a year ago, an exhibit at nearby Princeton University on 19th century Jewish artists was canceled, and I mean literally canceled, not metaphorically, because it included a sculpture by Ezekiel. Struggles over the lost cause remain at the forefront of the American culture wars. The removal of Confederate statues across the United States most famously on Richmond's Monument Avenue, led to a predictable backlash with many in the South and frankly in rural areas all across the country clinging to Confederate symbols and lost cause imagery um, as forms of resistance to a liberal elite. Given the continuing significance of the lost cause in America's culture wars, I ask, where do Southern Jews fit into this conversation about Confederate memory and the lost cause. I argue that since the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War, all the way through the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s and beyond, some Jews in the American South participated in the lost cause commemoration in order to better fully integrate into the white Christian majority. At the same time, they commemorated the lost cause in such a way that preserved and even celebrated their particularly Jewish religious identity. Furthermore, I argue that through lost cause commemoration, Southern Jews solidified a specifically Southern Jewish identity, an identity tied to an entire region rather than a specific city or state. The story of Jewish lost cause commemoration is also a story about whiteness in America. Despite significant anti-Jewish sentiment in the United States, Jews were defined as white and defined themselves as white all across the United States, but especially in the Jim Crow South, where the racial divide loomed largest. Jewish whiteness enabled Jewish participation in lost cause commemoration, augmenting their sense of belonging in the South in a way that was denied to African Americans. Still, we should not neglect the significance of the aforementioned anti-Semitism. Though anti-Semitism in America was far less prevalent than in Europe, 
It was still ever present and shaped the lives, experiences, and decisions of the American Jewish population. Anti-Semitism grew with the massive influx of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Though this immigration came mostly to large northern cities like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago, it affected the South as well. The infamous Leo Frank case of 1915, where a Jewish man in Atlanta was wrongly convicted of murder and then lynched by an angry mob, was the most prominent example of this resurgent anti-Semitism. In the 1920s, Henry Ford published anti-Semitic tracts in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, which had a national audience. Ivy League schools instituted Jewish quotas. A resurgent Ku Klux Klan targeted not only African Americans, but Catholics and Jews as well. By 1924, nativists and the government restricted immigration from Eastern Europe dramatically, effectively barring most Jews from coming to the United States. In the 1930s, Father Coughlin's anti-Semitic radio broadcasts reached millions of Americans, and the German-American Bund openly embraced Nazism. I mention this anti-Semitism not to justify Jewish participation in Lost Cause commemoration. In my opinion, it is not the scholar's task to justify or even to judge. The scholar must explain. This was the context in which Southern Jews lived. Anti-Semitism, or perhaps more importantly, the fear of anti-Semitism, even when it seemed largely absent, uh, was an enormous factor in the lives of Southern Jewry. Any opportunity to blend in, to be part of the mainstream, was an opportunity to avoid anti-Semitism. In the South, Lost Cause commemoration represented one such opportunity, including for Jews whose families immigrated to the South long after the Civil War, and even for Jews who migrated from the North. For some Southern Jews, I suspect it was easier to support racial integration than it would have been to oppose commemoration of the Lost Cause. And yet, there's a contradiction at the heart of Jewish commemoration of the lost cause. While Jews did want to fit in, to be accepted as equals and truly belong in the South, they rarely converted to Christianity. This is important because the lost cause was at once secular and religious. In his book, Baptized in Blood, the Religion of the Lost Cause, historian Charles Reagan Wilson understands the lost cause as the civil religion of the South, arguing, I quote, the lost cause was a mythic construct that helped white Southerners define a cultural identity in the aftermath of Confederate defeat. Quote. Yet despite calling it a civil religion, Wilson insists, again I quote, evangelical Protestantism lay at the heart of Southern identity and was central to Southern efforts to wage a cultural war against Northern influence after the Civil War. In essence, Christianity was crucial to the lost cause. How then did Southern Jews thread this needle? How did they walk this tightrope, having to deflect anti-Semitism, assert their belonging among the dominant white Christian population of the South, through its supposedly civil religion of the lost cause, while at the same time avoiding the overwhelmingly Protestant overtones of this civil religion. After all, the resurrectionist rhetoric, the South shall rise again, was nothing if not Christian in derivation. Southern Jews performed a balancing act, walking a tightrope between acceptance and anti-Semitism, between a sense of justice for African Americans and the racist attitudes that dominated the American South, between civil religion and overbearing Christianity. Their balance beam to walk this tightrope was a uniquely Jewish commemoration of the lost cause. So my focus for the remainder of the talk will not be on Jews like Moses Ezekiel, 
who celebrated the lost cause as any white Christian Southerner would. Instead, I'm going to focus on the specifically Jewish commemoration of the lost cause, which is to say the celebration of Jewish Confederate leaders and soldiers, and especially that celebration in Jewish terms and in Jewish contexts. Since I spent six years living in Richmond, many of my examples will be from there, though Jewish lost cause commemoration was very much a pan-Southern phenomenon. My talk is divided into three sections. First, I'm going to provide a range of examples of Jewish commemoration of the lost cause in the American South. Then briefly, I'm going to focus specifically on the commemoration of Judah P. Benjamin, the Sephardic Jew who was Attorney General, Secretary of State, and Secretary of War for the Confederate States of America, which helped consolidate a uniquely Southern Jewish identity. And in the final section, I'm going to look at more localized examples of Jewish lost cause commemoration, especially in post-World War II Richmond. And to conclude, I'll offer some analysis as to why Jews participated in lost cause commemoration and how that participation forged their identities as specifically Southern Jews, but how that identity is now diminishing as both the South and the larger Jewish community is transforming. Southern Jews balanced their Jewish and Southern identities by emphasizing Jewish participation in the Confederate Army and administration and by using Jewish ceremonies to honor their Confederate heroes. This was the case across the South, but perhaps the best example was the erection of the soldier section for Jewish Confederates killed in action in Richmond's Hebrew Cemetery. In May of 1866, in response to the formation of other Christian memorial associations after the war, a group of Richmond Jewish women established the Hebrew Ladies Memorial Association to look after some 30 graves of Confederate Jewish soldiers killed in battle near Richmond. The Hebrew Ladies Memorial Association, or HLMA, paid for the soldier section upkeep until 1930 and continue holding annual memorial services there to honor Jewish Confederate dead until at least 1939. For the HLMA, maintaining the soldier section of Hebrew Cemetery was about more than decorating the graves with flowers every year, though they did that too. It was about desperately wanting to fit in as Jews in a climate where anti-Jewish sentiment still played a prominent role. In her 1866 call to the Israelites of the South, Secretary of the HLMA, Rachel Levy, made reference to, and I quote, a brave people's struggle for independence. She was not referring to the formerly enslaved African Americans, but instead to Confederate soldiers who endured, and I quote, hardships so nobly for liberty's sake, the myriads of heroes who spilled their blood in defense of that glorious cause, end quote. She wanted the Jewish Confederates to be included in that number implicitly asserting that they shared that noble Southern blood. But then Levy noted the graves of soldiers would not be embraced by other non-Jewish burial societies. Though Southern Jews insisted throughout the antebellum period that they fully belonged to the communities in which they lived, they were not naive about the antipathy they faced from many in the non-Jewish population. They knew that they constantly needed to prove themselves loyal citizens of the South, and thus the HLMA was born to create a lasting place for slain Jewish Confederates. For Levy, the soldier section of Hebrew Cemetery would stand as a symbol of Jewish patriotism and bravery to those who doubted. Thus she concluded in her call, in time to come, when our grief shall have become in a measure silenced, and when the malicious tongue of slander 
ever so ready to assail Israel, shall be raised against us, then, with a feeling of mournful pride, we will point to this monument and say, there is our reply. This statement impressed the white Christian population of Richmond, and especially the women involved in the Christian memorial associations. Three groups, two Christian, one Jewish, worked in concert, if not together, maintaining friendly relations for decades. Only occasionally did the issue of Jewish religious difference emerge, such as in an early 20th century letter from then HLMA secretary Sarah Strauss Rosenbaum, who noted she could not attend one of the Christian group's memorial services because they took place on a Saturday, but promised that a committee from her Jewish group would attend the church memorial service, presumably on a Sunday. Keeping the Sabbath, but attending a church memorial service on Sunday, was a way for these women to assert their identity as Jews and as Southerners, and indeed as Southern Jews. Another example comes from Edward Kalish, rabbi of Richmond's Reform Synagogue, Beth Ahaba, from, if you can believe it, 1891 to 1945. Very long tenure. Kalish was a Northerner and a Midwesterner. He was born in Toledo, Ohio in 1865, just after the end of the Civil War, and grew up mostly in Chicago and Cleveland. After being ordained a Reform rabbi uh, in Cincinnati's Hebrew Union College, he held a pulpit briefly in Peoria, Illinois, for four years before joining Congregation Beth Ahaba at the tender age of 26. When Kalish came to Virginia, he absorbed Southern culture, including the lost cause. Over his long tenure, he presided over numerous Jewish Confederate memorial uh, ceremonies at Hebrew Cemetery, often with non-Jews in attendance. His words were always some variation of these, which he uttered in May of 1900. And quote, these soldiers as Jewish soldiers did stand for two things, love of their country and vindication of their people. Kalish explained the inaccurate but ever-present stereotype that Jews were loyal to no land and cowards when it came to defending their country. I quote, it remained for those fearful yet glorious days of 1861 to 1865 to tell of the courage and the soldierly qualities which 18 centuries of repression had not eradicated and of which these men and their brothers in faith gave such sublime evidence. Waxing poetic, Kalish proclaimed that the Maccabean spirit was reborn for those days before concluding, the cause for which they consciously fought was destined by the god of battles not to be won. The cause for which they unconsciously struggled has been gloriously helped. The implication of Kalish's words were clear. Jewish Confederates were like the Maccabees, re rebelling in a just cause against foreign domination. By celebrating Jewish Confederates, Kalish asserted Jewish belonging in the South in a way clearly denied to African Americans. Of all the Jewish Confederates Kalish celebrated in his long career, one loomed larger than them all, Judah P. Benjamin, Sephardic Jew and Attorney General, Secretary of War, and Secretary of State of the Confederate States of America. At a 1902 ceremony, at the Robert E. Lee Camp for Confederate Veterans in Richmond, Kalish presented a portrait of Judah P. Benjamin to the camp. Kalish praised Benjamin, the so-called brains of the Confederacy, as he was known. After expounding on Benjamin's career, Kalish remarked, I stand here in the name of the Jewish community of this city, some of whose members have given the means whereby this presentation has been made possible. We do this for the reason that we feel we are honoring ourselves in thus honoring a co-religionist. He was a hero, a statesman, 
a gentleman, and a patriot, we claim the privilege of sharing in the reflection of his glory. Richmond was Judah P. Benjamin's home for the four years of the Civil War, but it was not the only southern city that celebrated him. The pan-southern commemoration of Judah P. Benjamin helped establish a regional southern Jewish identity, distinct from any equivalent in the North. In 1912, local Zionist leader in Nashville, Annie M. Garfinkel, penned a lengthy profile for the Nashville City's mainstream daily newspaper, labeling Benjamin one of the most wonderful characters of history. In 1948, a reform and, conservative, reform and conservative congregations in Charlotte, North Carolina, came together to erect a stone in Benjamin's honor. In 1962, the Alabama chapter of B'nai B'rith held a themed dinner and dance called Judah P. Benjamin Night. Across the South, through the 1960s and beyond, Judah P. Benjamin served as a Jewish stand-in for Robert E. Lee a Jewish Confederate hero to commemorate in service of the lost cause. At the same time, many Southern communities had their local equivalents to Judah P. Benjamin in Arkansas, in Tennessee, uh, in Mississippi, different Confederate heroes. But again, I'm going to return to Richmond for perhaps the best example of a localized Southern Jewish lost cause uh, hero and, and a subsequent commemoration in uh, the fig figure of Reverend Maximilian Mickelbacher, the religious leader of the Reform Congregation Beth Ahaba before, during, and after the Civil War. And he's called Reverend because he was not actually ordained a rabbi. Later a lot of people call him rabbi, but not actually a rabbi. Born in what is now Germany in 1811, Mickelbacher um, uh, again, never ordained a rabbi, but had significant Judaic training and served the Richmond Jewish community for many years. Historical records show that Mickelbacher owned at least one enslaved person during his time there. He is best known to American Jewish historians for his so-called prayer for the Confederacy, which he wrote and delivered early during the Civil War. Mickelbacher had long been a hero to the Richmond Jewish community, and a plaque in his honor still hangs in Beth Ahaba. He was the major figure who was represented in Richmond's contribution to the 1954 American Jewish Tercentenary celebration. So let me just explain about that for a second. Um, the first Jewish community uh, arrived in New Amsterdam, now New York, in 1654. So 300 years later, 1954, Jews across the United States celebrated this momentous anniversary. Uh, it was a moment of pride uh, for all of American Jews, including in the South. But of course, it also occurred in a particular context. In May of 1954, the famous Brown v. Board decision had been uh, handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court effectively ruling that segregation in schools was unconstitutional and opening the door for desegregation in many other realms of American life. The vast majority of Southern Jews supported the Brown decision, but most did so quietly. Meanwhile, many white Christians in the Southern states did not take kindly to the decision, and Virginians were no exception. Barely a month after the decision, Virginia Senator Harry F. Byrd began his opposition to Brown and by August had joined with numerous other white Democrats to create the Gray Commission, ostensibly to study, but really to defeat Brown. And this was the context in which Richmond Jews celebrated the tercentenary. The most grandiose element of Richmond's tercentenary commemoration took place on October 14th, 1954 at the large local theater then known as the mosque it looks like a mosque today is the altria theater that's where i saw hamilton for example 
members of the Richmond Jewish community put on a play or pageant called Under Freedom, and Reverend Mickelbacher would feature prominently. The lead organizer of this event, incidentally, was Saul Viner, a West Virginia native who would go on to found the Southern Jewish Historical Society uh, I've presented at their conference and published in their journal. The historical narration in the script uh, was written by a businessman, Alan Krieger, who was born in Boston and raised in Long Island, received his BA from Columbia and MBA from Harvard before entering the military and then moving to Richmond after World War II. The dialogue in the play was written by Edith Lindemann Kalish, the film and theater critic for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, a songwriter and author of Jewish children's books, and the daughter-in-law of the aforementioned Rabbi Kalish. Edith Lindemann had grown up in Pittsburgh and Dayton, Ohio, before moving with her family to Richmond while in high school, and then uh, attending Barnard College for a couple of years as well. Thus, two Yankees wrote the play, right? which began with a prologue involving Emma Lazarus, but quickly moved to scenes from antebellum Virginia Jewish history. After a brief intermission, the chorus emerged singing Bonnie Blue Flag, a popular Confederate song during the Civil War. The narrator then began, the war between the states was a tragic pause in the material and spiritual growth of America. Despite being conceived in freedom and dedicated to liberty, Americans North and South can't countenance the bondage of one color of men to another. While the North gradually abandoned the practice, radical abolitionists delivered, and I quote, violent and vitriolic attacks on the institution of slavery and its supporters in the South, um, end quote, which according to this conventional lost cause interpretation that's being presented led to the Civil War. Jews divided according to geography. The narrator noted how some rabbis defended slavery and other rabbis opposed slavery and uh, talked about uh, 30 Jewish men and boys who served from Richmond uh, in, in the Civil War. And then the narration concluded by introducing uh, Reverend Mickelbacher, who composed the, uh, the prayer for the Confederacy and often traveled with troops to worship with them. So the opening scenes of this second act took place in 1862 on the battlefield and featured Mickelbacher reciting this prayer of the, to the Confederacy to various soldiers, including Robert E. Lee. That never happened, but in this play it did. Uh, the prayer spoke of uh, northern violation of the rights, liberties, and freedom of this, our Confederacy, and claimed that the Union sought to deprive us of the glorious inheritance which was left to us by the immortal fathers of this once great republic. It called on God to defend what it called the natural rights of the Confederates. Including this prayer emphasized the extent of the Richmond Jewish community's participation in the Confederate cause, and by extension, their sense of belonging in the South. The final scene of the play reflected a newer generation of immigrants. Set in 1900, it depicted a Jewish family celebrating their Uncle Ben upon his naturalization as a United States citizen. Ben says he and other new immigrants had to learn how to become an American quickly so he could, and I quote, forget the old unhappy things we used to know, presumably referring to anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Then, Ben pivoted back to the South, singing, carry me back to old Virginia, and his family joined in. Between 1940 and 1997, this was the official song of the state of Virginia. This song fits entirely into lost cause ideology. 
sentimentalizing life under slavery. And ultimately, the singing of this song faded seamlessly into another song, America the Beautiful, emphasizing the Americanness of Virginia and honoring the totality of the Virginia experience. This pageant showed Richmonders, even with very shallow roots in Virginia, making a large effort to incorporate the Virginia story, including uh, Jewish involvement uh, in the lost cause. These Jews felt that in order to integrate into their community, they had to show themselves to be American, Virginian, Southern, and with a special connection to the city of Richmond. That meant at least a partial embrace of the lost cause. Participating in the Confederate war effort rather than slavery, however, was the emphasis. Seven years later, Richmonders once again took part in a national commemoration, this time as part of the Civil War Centennial, so the 100th anniversary of the Civil War, a series of nationwide commemorations that took place from 1961 to 1965, and were of course not limited to Jews. As Robert J. Cook documents in his 2007 book, Troubled Commemoration, um, the Civil War centennial um, uh, began with a lot of sort of Cold War unity propaganda and lost cause nostalgia, largely excluding African Americans uh, and relegating slavery to the margins of the conflict. But eventually, it was eclipsed by the civil rights movement that was going on at the same time. And it would not become radical, but would move in a more progressive direction, including more African Americans and bringing slavery uh, closer to the center of the conversation. Right? And so here again, uh, context matters. Two years after Brown v. Board, Virginia Senator Harry F. Byrd called for massive resistance to school desegregation. And he and other politicians signed the Southern Manifesto against racial integration and in favor of states' rights. They fought tooth and nail against Brown. And in some cases, real school integration did not begin until the late 1960s or even the 1970s. Southern Jews, for the most part, did not participate in massive resistance to Brown. But most did keep their heads down as the civil rights movement got underway. This was often out of fear. Starting in late 1957 and through 1958, white supremacist terrorists bombed or attempted to bomb synagogues and Jewish community centers across the South in response to perceived uh, Jewish support for the civil rights movement in Florida, North Carolina, Alabama, um, and Tennessee. The most well-known bombing took place October of 1958 when the terrorists struck Atlanta's large Reform Synagogue belonging to the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation but known mostly as the Temple. Uh, and they were struck due to their rabbi Jacob Rothschild's outspoken and public support for the Civil Rights Movement which was shared by many of their uh, congregants. The Temple bombers, interestingly, called themselves the Confederate Underground, implicitly linking the lost cause to anti-Semitic violence. Thus, Southern Jews, again, felt themselves walking a tightrope. Most supported integration, but as I mentioned, did so quietly as they legitimately feared this very real anti-Semitic violence. Um, once again, for white Jews living in the Confeder former Confederate states, commemoration of the lost cause uh, provided an opportunity to assert belonging to the South, an opportunity unavailable to African Americans, who still suffered from brutal lynching, ever-present racial prejudice, and debilitating legal discrimination. In effect, Jewish lost cause commemoration acted as a sort of balance beam on this tout rope where Jews could quietly support integration while loudly proclaiming their loyalty to the South. Yet there is also some indication 
of resistance to the lost cause narrative. In 1960, just a few weeks after the famous sit-ins that took place at Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, 34 young African Americans in Richmond held a sit-in at the lunch counter of Tallheimer's department store. The Tallheimer's were an old, established, wealthy German-Jewish family in Richmond who were active in the Beth Ahaba congregation. This is 1960. Right? Their store is uh, subject to a sit-in. In 1962, two years after the sit-ins helped desegregate the Tallheimer's lunch counter, the store's management displayed a photo of Abraham Lincoln in the window as an advertisement for the Civil War uh, centennial commemoration that was going on. Right? Symbolic of the way that the winds were blowing, right? Putting a, uh, uh, a photo of Abraham Lincoln in your store window uh, in Richmond, Virginia. And in fact, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy invited the store owner, William Tallheimer Jr., to consult on his civil rights bill. Now the highlight of the Jewish participation in, Richmond, uh, in Richmond's uh, Civil War Centennial came that same year, 1963. Saul Viner, same Saul Viner from 1954, arranged a memorial service on Sunday, October 20th, 1963, at Hebrew Cemetery for Private Henry Ginsberger, a German-born Jewish peddler who had immigrated to Salem, Virginia, and fought and died for the Confederacy. Ginsberger had been killed in action at the Battle of Cold Harbor in 1864, but his grave was mislabeled Henry Gersberg, and he had been lost to history. The chief purpose of the ceremony in 1963 was to correct the gravestone and write the historical record. The ceremony began with introductory remarks by Viner and then an opening prayer by Beth Ahaba Rabbi Ariel Goldberg. Richmond's mayor, Eleanor P. Shepard, also spoke, and then Kate Bendheim, prominent uh, Jewish uh, uh, woman in the community, unveiled the new tombstone. Kate Bendheim was the great-great-granddaughter of Reverend Maximilian Mickelbacher. By contrast, Saul Viner's family immigrated from Eastern Europe long after the Civil War, and he was born in West Virginia, which had split from Virginia to remain with the Union. In his remarks, Viner explained the purpose of this particular ceremony, which was to, under, which was to establish a better understanding of the forces which resulted in the tragedy a century ago. Viner went on to explain, our role is not to glorify war, but to renew the past for the benefit, we hope, of the present and the future. Our role has further been to tell the story of how the average man or women, the you or I, of a hundred years ago, was affected by the war. For that reason, they sought to, and I quote, memorialize a lone Jewish youth who met his death on a field of battle near this city, far from home and family, and through this ceremony, remember all who fell. He then made reference to Reverend Mickelbacher, whose prayer for the Confederate soldiers still lives on. Saul Viner's rhetoric is instructive here. His is the language of the social historian, showing concern for the average man or woman, though of course still excluding African Americans. In his remarks honoring fallen Confederate soldiers, Viner did what the Passover story does, invite modern day Jews to imagine themselves in a historical era. Except instead of placing themselves during the exodus from Egypt, at Mount Sinai, or entering the Promised Land, he is asking uh, his audience to imagine themselves as Jews fighting for the Confederacy. Viner, a West Virginian whose family came to America long after the Civil War, was placing himself and other Southern Jews in the supposedly her uh, heroic Confederate narrative. Perhaps this is not so unusual. In his famous work, Zahor, 
Historian Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi argued for the significance of communal collective memory in Jewish religion. More recently, scholar of American Judaism Rachel B. Gross has suggested that nostalgia itself constitutes a crucial form of Jewish religious practice in the United States in that it can, and I quote, inspire longing for Jewish communities across time and space. Yet what is unusual, perhaps, is for Jews without a direct connection to a particular historical narrative, inserting themselves into another group's history, a foreign narrative and foreign nostalgia, in order to fit in, but doing so in a particularly Jewish way. After the civil rights movement, lost cause commemoration did not disappear, but it did gradually fall out of favor, particularly among the Jewish community in the South. The Southern Jewish community became, um, uh, became less distinctly Southern, as more Jews have migrated from the North to places like Atlanta, Houston, and the Raleigh-Durham area. Younger generations of Jews born in the South have little interest in lost cause commemoration. Advances in the fields of US history in general and American Jewish history in particular have led to a reevaluation of Jewish Confederates. A simple thought experiment should demonstrate how much has changed. In 2010, the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History opened in Philadelphia with an exhibit titled only in America. Okay, you see the Weizmann Museum. In this exhibit, Only in America, 18 individuals were displayed in a sort of hall of fame for American Jews. Uh, 10 selected by a panel of scholars and 8 by a public online vote. Honorees included 19th century figures such as Reform Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise and poet Emma Lazarus to modern celebrities like Sandy Koufax and Barbara Streisand. Judah P. Benjamin was rightly and unsurprisingly not among them. But had such a list been made 100 years prior, or perhaps even 50 years prior, he almost certainly would have been in an American Jewish Hall of Fame. Judah Benjamin is, of course, featured in the museum which tells the history of American Jewry, just as he is featured in this new uh, Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in New Orleans that opened in 2021. Benjamin and all Jewish confer uh, Confederates belong in history museums, in our works of scholarship, where they should be remembered and studied, but not celebrated. And as Jews, particularly of the younger generation, have been involved in mass movements to remove Confederate monuments across the country that followed the murder of George Floyd. We should also note that monuments and plaques to Judah P. Benjamin have also been removed uh, in California, in Sarasota, Florida, and in Charlotte, one of which is now in the possession of this museum in New Orleans. Um, and they belong in museums, right? So future generations of historians can study how and why many American Jews once chose to celebrate the Confederacy, but are now aiding in the effort to undo the racist and treasonous uh, Confederate past. As Americans, Jews and non-Jews alike, continue to fight the culture wars, understanding this trajectory from Confederate celebration to rejection and repudiation can help us remember which side we are on for the battle still to come. Thank you. Let's start with someone in the room. Um, who's got questions? All right, there's like a bunch of you. I'm going to go for Ethan first because I think he's the first. So first, just as like a, a work in progress thing, um, do you have any plans to like expand on this research um, or take it further? Absolutely, yes. My plan is to, to turn this into a book and uh, to expand it 
much beyond Richmond. Or, you know, originally I wrote an article um, about the lost cause and the Richmond Jewish community in the civil rights era, which appeared in a, a journal Southern Jewish History. And so my plan is to expand it temporally and also expand it geographically. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, it, how I'm going to do that. I had an idea to maybe focus on three cities, uh, Richmond, Charleston, and Atlanta. Charleston is the, uh, the, oldest, one, the oldest Jewish community in the South, really, and uh, is the colonial, has a you know, colonial Jewish community was kind of interesting. And Atlanta, of course, is more representative of the New South and is today um, you know, one of the biggest cities and major cities in the South. So, um, but I might expand it beyond that as well because they're very good resources um, in North Carolina and, uh, and some other places too. Thanks. This is fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so this question, I'm, I'm expressing it as a Canadian who doesn't always understand <laughs> some of this stuff. But uh, I was wondering if some of the themes of this Confederacy and the Lost Cause, like the sort of states' rights kind of language, kind of pseudo-libertarian, uh, self-rule kind of ideas, was that part of the appeal? Like this idea that if we're not accepted in a larger federal system, maybe we could, I mean, they're not going to be their own state, but, but I don't know, something about autonomy and self-rule, was that part of the appeal at all, or did, did that play any role? It's a great question. Um, I, I don't know for certain uh, whether it did or not. I mean, I think the context of the South broadly, where, you know, if you contrast it to the North, particularly in the post-Civil War period, which is, of course, what I'm looking at, um, the North has a lot of different ethnic groups coming together, whereas the South has that, but to a far lesser extent, it's the black-white divide that is more central. And so, I think that's the big context there, that Jews really want to position themselves on the white side of that divide. Um, and it's very important that they do for, for social and economic reasons. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's, if it's a, particularly a state's rights uh, framework, though. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. I mean, Jews were actually very involved surprisingly involved in politics. You have a lot of Jews who become mayors of towns in the South, right, where Jews are in the minority. Uh, so, and, and so I think they're sort of following the political trends there. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is the South, in the South I think Jews, the reform movement is stronger in the South. It has it has less contestation than it does in the, in uh, in the South. And the reform, a big swath of the reform movement, though not all of it, was really invested in defining Judaism as a religion and not defining Judaism in a sort of racial or ethnic sense. And so I think those were the kind of Southern trends that I see so far. Right, I still need to do. Uh, more research on this, but that that Jews were very uh, found useful for them to fit in. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah, this is great. Thank you. Um, and this is sort of, I guess, more of a question from my own uh, historical ignorance. Um, you, you know, I think you had mentioned we're all familiar with the larger sort of um, Jewish diaspora in northern cities: Chicago, Philadelphia, New York. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that as uh, in the late 20th century, as Jews immigrated to southern cities from northern cities, this opinion changed. Could you explain a little bit the, the I guess, uh, any trends in the path of the diaspora to southern cities like Charleston or Richmond or Atlanta during the, 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 the Civil War era and maybe post-Civil War? Was this more immigrants coming from Europe to southern cities directly or coming from northern cities and then in some later time period or later generations moving to southern cities? So um, to make a, to make a long, right, yeah, long story mean, short, right, yeah. um, generally historians divide uh, American Jewish into history into these sort of three waves of immigration, and other historians have, of course, complicated that and tried to poke holes in that idea. But the earliest uh, congregations in the United States, the, the ones that were 
pre-United States that were colonial were uh, started in the Sephardic style. So they were typically started by Sephardic Jewish immigrants who came uh, often from, well, ori originally from, uh, of course, Spain and Portugal, but then they had made their homes in uh, Amsterdam or in uh, other colonies or, or in London or in other British colonies and things like that. That's sort of who's founding the communities in Charleston and Savannah, and uh, which are the two southern uh, Jewish communities uh, in the colonial period. Um, but then in the 19th century, you have this big wave of immigration coming from German-speaking lands, where it's not yet Germany. That's like people like Michelbacher, right? That's where he comes from. Um, and so they go both north and south, but, uh, but after 1820, that's when New York really starts to grow in population and, and, and the north starts to become, you know, have have a far larger population uh, than the South does. So for example, in the Civil War itself, um, they estimate seven or 8,000 Jews fought for the Union, whereas two to 3,000 fought for the Confederacy. Though interestingly enough, I didn't get to this in, the, uh, in my talk, but it both, the ceremony in 1963 at the, um, at the, at the Hebrew Cemetery, and then also in another play that I didn't mention in 1965, th this idea that 10,000 Jews served for the Confederacy is talked about, and that number is bandied about a lot, and that many scholars repeat it over, and it's completely false, right? Uh, you know, there, that's, it's nowhere near 10,000. Uh, even, even like Jewish scholars today who are more in the almost like sympathetic to the Confederate camp, right? it was nowhere near that big, right? But there was this sense that Jews really wanted to say, yes, we were a big part of this effort, right? I, I don't know if this is like a conspiracy theory or just like a fringe thing, but I've, I've heard it alleged that um, in terms of like, uh, I guess like, you know, slave owning like white people, it was like um, uh, a lot of like Jewish people as opposed to other types of white people. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned how they, uh, that is like Jewish lost cause people would, you know, focus more on the involvement in the Confederacy than like the slave owning aspect. Um, did they ever have to like, did they ever deal with allegations, I guess, of like, I don't know, an outsized uh, slave holding influence or was that not a thing at that time? So this is this is a very controversial issue and it is there are a lot of conspiracy theories. Uh, the truth is as I mentioned some Jews did own enslaved people but they were a tiny 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 proportion of uh, slave owners in in the south and beyond right I mean the 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 I, I think I can't remember which historian said this, but basically like, if Jews did not exist, slavery would not have changed at all. It would have had zero impact on the slave trade, right? So Jews played a very, there were, but there were some Jews who were involved. Most were not involved in the trade of slaves, uh, or of enslaved people, I should say. Um, but there were some, for example, um, the oldest synagogue in uh, the United States today, which is in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, one of the major uh, benefactors, uh, Aaron Lopez, of that uh, synagogue uh, was, uh, one of the things he dealt in was enslaved people. Right? He, was, he was a slave trader. And there were, there were Jews involved in the slave trade, but generally, uh, minimally. Le much less than the Christian population. Now. Jews also owned enslaved people, so not necessarily involved in the trade, but again, no, not at a higher proportion than general. What, what the, there's the, the one piece of scholarship which was written by um, this rabbi, Bertram Korn, which he wrote it actually in the 50s or 60s, it's still authoritative today. No one has really updated this all that much. But what his, his basic point was that Jews were no different than other people in this regard, right? If you were wealthy enough, if you were a white person defined as white and were wealthy enough to own enslaved people, 
you probably would, right? Because it was useful to you, one, in terms of just your daily life and maybe your profession, and the added bonus if you're Jewish, or bonus, but it, it, it's going with fitting in, right? It's just going along with um, the way uh, that society um, functioned. But there's no evidence that Jews were harsher or less harsh as masters, right? There's no evidence of that kind of thing at all. Um, I mean, this is, this is a much bigger issue than my, or it's a different issue than what my, um, my project is about, but it became very controversial in the 90s when uh, the Nation of Islam put out a book that essentially accused Jews of dominating the slave trade. And then a bunch of scholars came out with uh, more reputable scholarship that debunked that myth. So that's kind of after yeah. the whole, okay. Yeah. Thank you for this presentation. It was really enjoyable. Um, and one thing that I was thinking about as you were talking is what sort of got you interested in this particular topic? Um, was it something about the lost cause? Was it living down there? Living in Richmond. <laughs> I mean, that was when I, you know, my first, my book has nothing to do with the South, right? I was not a person who was interested in Southern Jewish history. And then I got this job in Richmond and I was living in the South and I was living through history, right? As these statues were coming down and I started, I, you know, I'm also an archive rat, like put me in front of musty old documents and I'm happy. So I would just, I, live, I happened to live across the Virginia Historical Society when I first moved to Richmond and they had Saul Viner's papers. And I had heard of him because I knew about the organization. There's, there's a book that, he, he has an American Jewish History Book Award, right? The Saul Viner Book Award. Uh, so I'd heard of him, but I didn't know all that much about him. And he actually only passed away in 2006, so a lot of scholars in my field know or knew him. Um, but in any event, uh, they had all his papers, and then I saw this ceremony. I found the program for that 1963 ceremony. I said, this is really fascinating. And I just, you know, kept digging. I would like to ask everyone to help me thank... Thank you.